Yafar ibn Muhammad as Sadiq, Arabic, Jafar bn Mehmd al Sadiq 700 or 702 to 765 CE, commonly known as Yafar al Sadiq or simply al Sadiq the Truthful, was the sixth Shia Imam and a major figure in the Hanafi and Maliki schools of Sunni jurisprudence. He was a descendant of Ali on the side of his father, Muhammad al Bakir, and of Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr on the side of his mother, Umm Farwa bint al Qasim. Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr was raised by Ali, but was not his son. Ali used to say, Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr is my son but from Abu Bakr's lineage. Al Sadiq is the sixth Imam and recognized by all Shia sects as an Imam, and is revered in traditional Sunni Islam as a transmitter of hadith, prominent jurist, and mystic to Sufis. Despite his wide-ranging attributions in a number of religious disciplines, no works penned by Jafar himself remain extant. Al Sadiq was born in either 700 or 702 CE. He inherited the position of Imam from his father in his mid-thirties. As Imam, Al Sadiq stayed out of the political conflicts that embroiled the region, evading the many requests for support that he received from rebels. He was the victim of some harassment by the Abbasid caliphs, and was eventually, according to most Shia Muslims, poisoned at the orders of the caliph al-Mansur. In addition to his connection with Sunni schools of Sunni jurisprudence, he was a significant figure in the formulation of Shia doctrine. The traditions recorded from al-Sadiq are said to be more numerous than all hadiths recorded from all other Shia imams combined. As the founder of Jafari jurisprudence, Al Sadiq also elaborated the doctrine of Nas, divinely inspired designation of each Imam by the previous Imam, and Isma, the infallibility of the Imams, as well as that of Tachiyah. The question of succession after Al Sadiq's death was the cause of division among Shias who considered his eldest son, Ismail, who had died before his father, to be the next Imam, and those who believed his third son Musa al Qadim was the Imam. The first group became known as the Ismailis, and the second, larger, group was named Jafari or the Twelvers. Topic. Birth and early life Jafar al-Sadiq was born in Medina either in 8699-700 or 8373-704. On his father's side he was a great-great-grandson of Ali, the first imam. His mother, Farwa bint al-Qasim was a great-granddaughter of Abu Bakr. Al-Sadiq was the first of the Shia Imams to be descended from both Abu Bakr, the first ruler of the Rashidun Caliphate, and Ali, the first Imam. However, Shias believed that the previous caliphs, by taking over control of the Islamic Empire, had unlawfully unseated Ali, who was the rightful heir to the Caliphate. During the first 14 years of his life he lived alongside his grandfather Zayn al-Abedin, and witnessed the latter's withdrawal from politics. He also noted the respect that the famous jurists of Medina held toward Zayn al Abedin in spite of his few followers. In his mother's house, al Sadiq also interacted with his grandfather Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, who was respected by the people of Medina as a famous traditionalist. During this period, Umayyad power was at its climax, and the childhood of al Sadiq was coincided with the growing interest of the people of Medina in prophetic science and interpretations of the Quran. Imamate Al Sadiq was 34 or 37 when he inherited the position of Imama or Imamate upon the death of his father Muhammad al Bakir. He held the Imamate for 28 years, longer than any other Shia Imam. His Imamate was a crucial period in Islamic history for both political and doctrinal areas. Prior to Al Sadiq, the majority of Shias had preferred the revolutionary politics of Zayd, Al Sadiq's uncle, to the mystical quietism of Al Sadiq's father and grandfather. Zayd had claimed that the position of an imam was conditional on his appearing publicly to claim his rights. Al Sadiq, on the other hand, elaborated the doctrine of imamate, which says, "Imamate is not a matter of human choice or self-assertion, but that each imam possesses a unique ilm knowledge which qualifies him for the position." This knowledge was passed down from the Prophet Muhammad through the line of Ali's immediate descendants. The doctrine of Nas or divinely inspired designation of each Imam by the previous Imam, therefore, was completed by Al Sadiq. In spite of being designated as the Imam, Al Sadiq would not lay claim to the caliphate during his lifetime. <laughs> Under the Umayyad rulers 
Al Sadiq's imamate extended over the latter half of the Umayyad Caliphate, which was marked by many revolts, mostly by Shia movements, and eventually the violent overthrow of the Umayyad Caliphate by the Abbasids, descendants of Muhammad's uncle, Abbas. Al Sadiq maintained his father's policy of quietism, and played no part in the numerous rebellions. He stayed out of the uprising of Zaydits who gathered around al Sadiq's uncle, Zayd, who had the support Mutazilites and the traditionalists of Medina and Kufa. Al Sadiq also did not support the rebellion led by his cousin, Muhammad al Nafs al Zakiyah, who was inspired by Qaysanites. Al Sadiq played no part in the Abbasid rebellion against the Umayyads. His response to a message requesting help from Abu Muslim, the Khorasani leader of an uprising against the Umayyads, became famous. Al Sadiq asked for a lamp and burned Abu Muslim's letter, saying to the envoy who brought it, Tell your master what you have seen. In burning Abu Muslim's letter, he had also said, This man is not one of my men, this time is not mine. Al Sadiq also evaded requests for assistance to other claims to the throne, without advancing his own claims. He had said that even though he, as the designated Imam, was the true leader of the Ummah, he would not press his claim to the caliphate. This conscious position of neutrality was likely why Jafar was tolerated by the Umayyad court for so long. This position also gave rise to the legal precedent of Tachia. Topic: <inaudible> Under the Abbasid rulers. The end of the Umayyad dynasty and beginning of the Abbasid was a period during which central authority was weak, allowing Al-Sadiq to teach freely in a school which trained about 4000 students. A school of this size was unusual for religious teachers at this time. Among these were Abu Hanifa and Malik ibn Anas, founder of two major Sunni schools of law, the Hanafiya and the Malikiya. Wasil ibn Adah, founder of Mu'tazila school, was also among his pupils. After the Abbasid revolution had overthrown the Umayyad Caliphate, it turned against Shia groups who had previously been its allies against the Umayyads. The new Abbasid rulers, who had risen to power on the basis of their descent from Muhammad's uncle Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib, were suspicious of al-Sadiq, because Shias had always believed that leadership of the Ummah was a position issued by divine order, and which was given to each imam by the previous imam. In addition, al-Sadiq had a large following, both among scholars and among those who believed him to be the imam. During rule of al-Mansur, al-Sadiq was summoned to Baghdad along with some other prominent men from Medina in order for the caliph to keep a close watch on them. Al-Sadiq, however, asked the caliph to excuse him from going there by reciting a hadith which said that, The man who goes away to make a living will achieve his purpose, but he who sticks to his family will prolong his life. Al-Mansur reportedly accepted his request. After the defeat and death of his cousin Muhammad al-Nafs al-Zakiyah in 762, however, al-Sadiq thought it advisable to obey al-Mansur's summons. After a short stay in Baghdad, however, he convinced the caliph that he was not a threat, and was allowed to return to Medina. Toward the end of his life, he was subject to some harassment by the Abbasid caliphs. The governor of Medina was instructed by the caliph to burn down his house, an event which reportedly did al-Sadiq no harm. To cut his ties with his followers, al-Sadiq was also watched closely and occasionally imprisoned. Through these trials, al-Sadiq appears to have continued his scholarship and remained an influential teacher in his native Medina and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> Family life Al-Sadiq married Fatima al-Hassan, a descendant of al-Hassan ibn Ali, with whom he had two sons, Ismail ibn Jafar the Ismaili sixth Imam and Abdullah al-Afta. Following his wife's death, al-Sadiq purchased a Burberry or Andalusian slave named Hamida Khatan Arabic, Hamite Khatan freed her, trained her as an Islamic scholar, and then married her. She bore him two more sons, Musa al-Qadim the seventh twelver Imam, and Muhammad al-Dibaj. She was revered by the Shias, especially by women, for her wisdom. She was known as Hamida the Pure. Jafar al-Sadiq used to send women to learn the tenets of Islam from her, said that, Hamida is pure from every impurity like the ingot of pure gold. Imam Jafar also had a son called Ishaq, who reportedly married Sayyidah Nafisa bint al-Hasan. Nafisa was a descendant of al-Hasan ibn Ali, and teacher of Sunni Imam ash Shafi. Topic. Death 
Al Sadiq was arrested several times by Umayyad and Abbasid caliphs Hisham, Safa, and Mansur. He was particularly seen as a threat by the newly minted Abbasids who felt challenged by his strong claim to the title of caliph. When he died in 148 765 at the age of 64 or 65, many Shi'i sources suspected that he was poisoned at the behest of Mansur. Al Sadiq's death led to uncertainty about the succession of the Imamate. He was buried in Medina, in the famous Janital Baki Cemetery, and his tomb was a place of pilgrimage until 1926. It was then that the Wahhabis conquered Medina for the second time and raised the tomb, along with all other prominent Islamic shrines, with the exception of that of the Prophet Muhammad. According to Tabatabai, upon hearing the news of al Sadiq's death, Mansur wanted to put an end to the Imamate. Mansur reportedly wrote to the governor of Medina, commanding him to read the Imam's testament, and to behead the person named in it as the future Imam. However, the governor found that al Sadiq had chosen four people rather than one Mansur himself, the governor, the Imam's oldest son Abdullah al Afta, and Musa al Kazim, his younger son. Succession The Shia group had begun to split during the lifetime of al Sadiq, when his eldest son Ismail ibn Jafar predeceased him. His death occurred in the presence of many witnesses. After the death of Jafar al-Sadiq, his following fractured further, with the larger group, who came to be known as the Twelvers, following his younger son Musa al-Qadim. Another group believed instead that Ismail had been designated as the next imam, and that since he had predeceased his father, the imamate had passed to Ismail's son Muhammad ibn Ismail and his descendants. This latter group became known as the Ismailis. Some Ismailis believe that Ismail had not actually died, but would reappear as Mahdi, the rejuvenator of Islam in the Shia doctrine. Still other groups accepted either Abdullah al-Afta or Muhammad ibn Jafar al-Sadiq al both sons of the Jafar al-Sadiq, as the Imam. A final group believed that al-Sadiq had been the last Imam, and that the lineage had not continued. After the death of Musa al Kazim, the majority of his followers recognized his son Ali al Rida as the eighth Imam, while others believed that al Kazim had been the last Imam. This latter group became known as the Waqafiyya. No major divisions occurred in Shiaism from the eighth to the twelfth Imam, whom the majority of the Shia Twelvers considered to be Muhammad al Mahdi. Among the sects which separated from the majority, only Zaydia and Ismaili continue to exist today. Religious views Al-Sadiq religious views are recorded as authority in the writing of number of contradictory positions. The use of his name as an authority within the Sufi, scientific, Sunni legal, Ismaili and extremist writings shows his importance as a figure within the development of early Muslim thought. According to Yaqubi it was customary for anyone who wanted to relate a tradition from him to say, The learned one informed us. Malik ibn Anas, when quoting anything from al-Sadiq, would say, The thicka truthful Jafar b. Muhammad himself told me that. The same is reported from Abu Hanifa. The works attributed to him may be of dubious authenticity, but they do establish his name at least as indicating a mastery of learning generally, and the Islamic sciences in particular. Though most groups wish to recruit al-Sadiq's legacy for their own cause, the most extensive source for his teachings is to be found within the Imami Shia tradition. For Twelver Shias Jafar al-Sadiq is the sixth Imam who established the Shiism as serious intellectual force in the late Umayyad and early Abbasid periods. According to Tabatabai the number of traditions left behind by al-Sadiq and his father were more than all the hadiths recorded from Muhammad and all the other Shia Imams combined. Shia thought starting with Sayyid Haydar Amuli, and leading to Safavid philosophers like Mir Damad, Mullah Sadra and Qazi Sayyid Kumi continuing to the present day is based on Shia Imams tradition especially al-Sadiq. <laughs> <laughs> Jafari school of law Shia jurisprudence became known as Jafari jurisprudence after Jafar al-Sadiq, whose legal dicta were the most important source of Shia law. Like Sunni law, Jafari jurisprudence is based on the Quran and the Hadith, and also based on the consensus Unlike the Sunnis, Shias give more weight to reasoning while Sunnis only allow for a kind of analogical reasoning 
Al-Sadiq is presented as one who denounces personal opinion and analogical reasoning of his contemporaries arguing that God's law is occasional and unpredictable, and that the servant's duty is not to embark on reasoning in order to discover the law, but to submit to the inscrutable will of God as revealed by the Imam. In his book Makbula Omar ibn Hanzala who was a disciple of Al -Sadiq, asks the Imam how legal disputes within the community should be solved, and whether one should take such cases to the ruler Sultan and his judges. Jafar al-Sadiq replies in the negative saying that those who take their disputes to the rulers and their judges get only sot unlawful decision. Instead al-Sadiq recommends an unofficial system of justice for the community, and that the disputants should turn to those who relate our i.e., the Imams hadiths. The reason for this is that the Imams have made such a one a judge over you. Topic. Importance in Sufism See also, Encyclopedia Iranica, Jafar al-Sadiq e. and Sufism 1. Jafar al-Sadiq holds a special prominence among Sufi orders due to his claimed connections to some of Sufism's earliest theologians. He is elevated as an individual of great spiritual knowledge in many early works of Sufi literature, such as those by Abu Bakr Kalabadi or later in the writings of Sufi poet Abu Hamid bin Abu Bakr Ibrahim Attar .Attar claims that Jafar, more than the other Imams, was a spiritual forebear to Sufism when he says he spoke more than the other Imams concerning the path tarikat. Attar's attributed sayings of al-Sadiq are full of Sufi-specific terminology such as he had passed away fana, figuratively refers to the death of the ego and window into the heart, it is suspicious that these terms are absent from older collections of sayings attributed to Jafar. It is also worth noting that some historical jurists and authors, such as Makata's Artabili d. saw Sufi claims of relation to al-Sadiq as a fabricated tie created to lend historical justification to the Sufis. While it is apparent in these writings that Jafar al-Sadiq was regarded as a founding figure in Sufism, the historical situation is more difficult to ascertain. Given his large following and established school madrasa, he almost certainly was a teacher to proto-Sufis. Perhaps, as claimed by Attar, this included Abu No Aym, Safian Tauri d. a well-known jurist and ascetic in his time. It is through Safian that one of the most repeated attributions to Jafar's character reportedly comes. Attar relates, Sadiq was seen wearing a precious robe of silk. They said, Son of the Prophet of God, this is not in accord with the life of your holy family. He took that man by the hand and drew it into his sleeve, which was clad in coarse lint so that his hand was pricked. Sadiq said, This is for God and this is for men. This verse shows us that Jafar was viewed by Sufi sources as processing a humbleness and inner piety that was a cornerstone of Malamashia thought. The Malamatia were closely associated with the Sufis, and these two mystical traditions had, in many ways, been blended by the time of Attar. Whether these stories are any most than myth crafted by later generations is not something that can be conclusively determined. What can be said is that Sufi teachers often traced the source of their knowledge back to the teaching of al-Sadiq and that perceived content of these teaching remain relevant to Sufi practice today. Topic. Theology Jafar al-Sadiq's view on theology is transmitted through Mufazil who recorded his own questions and al-Sadiq's answers in a book known as Ketab al-Tahid in which al-Sadiq gives proofs as the unity of God. This book is considered identical to the Ketab al elaliya which is a reply to Mufazil's request from al-Sadiq for a refutation of those who deny God. Hesham ibn Hakam d. is another famous student of the Imam who proposed a number of doctrines that later became Orthodox Shia theology, including the rational necessity of the divinely guided Imam in every age to teach and lead God's community. Al-Sadiq is attributed with the statement, Whoever claims that God has ordered evil, has lied about God. Whoever claims that both good and evil are attributed to him, has lied about God. This view which is accordance with that of Mutazilite doctrine seems to absolve God from the responsibility for evil in the world. 
Al-Sadiq says that God does not order created beings to do something without providing for them a means of not doing it, though they do not do it, or not do it without God's permission." Al-Sadiq expressed a moderate view between compulsion jab and giving the choice to man taviz, stating that God decreed some things absolutely, but left some others to human agency. This assertion was widely adopted afterwards and was called al amr bain al amrain which meant neither predestination nor delegation but a position between the two. Al-Sadiq's view therefore is recorded as supporting either position as it is reported in an exchange between him and an unknown interlocutor. The interlocutor asks if God forces his servants to do evil or whether he has delegated power to them. Al-Sadiq's answers negatively to both questions. When asked, what then? He replies, the blessings of your Lord are between these two. It is narrated in Hadith that Jafar al-Sadiq has said, We are the people well grounded in knowledge and we are the ones who know how to interpret it. Tafsir The works attributed to Jafar al-Sadiq in Tafsir Quranic exegesis, are mostly described as the Sufi mystical works such as Tafsir al-Qur'an, Manafe Sower al-Qur'an, and Kawasasa al qor and al azam The attribution of these works to al-Sadiq, however, is suspected. In his books Haq eq al-Tafsir and Ziyadat Haq eq al-Tafsir, Abd al-Rahman Solami cites al-Sadiq as one of his major, if not the major, source of knowledge concerning the meaning of Quranic verses. Kedab al-Jafr, an early mystical commentary on the Quran, Tafsir, is also attributed to al-Sadiq. According to Ibn Khaldun, it was originally written on the skin of a young bull, allowing the Imam to reveal the hidden meaning of the Quran. Al Sadiq is said to have proposed a fourfold model of Quran interpretation. He said that, The Book of God comprises four things the statement set down, the implied purport, the hidden meanings, relating to the supra sensible world, and the exalted spiritual doctrines. He said that the plain meanings were for the common people, the hidden meanings for the elite, the implied meanings for the friends of God, and the exalted spiritual doctrines, were the province of the prophets. He stated that hadith, or traditional sayings of the prophet, should be rejected if they contradicted the Quran. Topic. Doctrine of Tachiya Al-Sadiq adopted Tachiya as a defensive tool against the violence and threats that were directed against him and the Shias. Tachiya was a form of religious dissimulation, or a legal dispensation whereby a believing individual can deny their faith while they are in fear or at risk of significant persecution. In other words, Tachiya says that it is acceptable to hide one's true opinions if by revealing them, one puts oneself or others in danger. The doctrine was developed by al-Sadiq, and served to protect the Shias when al-Mansur, the Abbasid Caliph, conducted a brutal and oppressive campaign against Alids and their supporters. According to Moezi, in the early sources Tachiya means, the keeping or safeguarding of the secrets of the Imam's teaching. Divergence of traditions is, therefore, sometimes justified by Shia Imams as a result of the need for using Tachiya. He who is certain that we the Imams proclaim only the truth al may he be satisfied with our teaching, asserts al-Sadiq. And if he hears us say something contradictory to what he heard earlier, he should know that we are acting only in his own interest. Practicing Tachiya also had an esoteric significance for those who believed that their teachings should not be comprehensible to ordinary ulama, and so hid their more profound teachings. Topic. Works According to Haywood half a dozen religious works bear al-Sadiq's name as author, though none of them can be firmly described as being written by al-Sadiq. It is probable that al-Sadiq was an author who left the writing to his students. The alchemist, Jeber, for example, suggested that some of his works are little more than records of Jafar's teaching or summaries of hundreds of monographs written by him. Jafar al-Sadiq is also cited in a wide range of historical sources, including al-Tabari, al-Yaqabai and al-Masudi. 
Al Dahabi recognizes his contribution to Sunni tradition, and Ismaili scholars such as Qadi al Numan recorded his traditions in their work. Ketab al Jafr is a commentary on the Quran, which, according to Ibn Khaldun, was first written on the skin of a young bull, which allowed al Sadiq to reveal the hidden meaning of the Quran. Various versions of his will, and a number of collections of legal dicta, are attributed to him as well. There are many reports attributed to him in the early Shia hadith collections such as Muhammad ibn Yaqub al-Kulaini's Kitab al-Kafi, where they are featured as central sources of imami doctrine, al haft wal Azela, and Kedab al sirat which are containing secret revelations. To Mofazil are also attributed to al-Sadiq, and had an important role in the elaboration of the esoteric doctrine of the Noziris, for whom al-Sadiq is an influential figure. Topic. Selected quotations The most perfect of men in intellect is the best of them in ethics. Charity is the zakat of blessings, intercession is the zakat of dignity, illnesses are the zakat of bodies, forgiveness is the zakat of victory, and the thing whose zakat is paid is safe from taking by Allah. He who answers all that he has asked, surely is mad. Whoever fears God, God makes all things fear him, and whoever does not fear God, God makes him fear all things. Allah Almighty has said, People are dear to me like family. Therefore, the best of them is the one who is nicer to others and does his best to resolve their needs. One of the deeds Allah Almighty appreciates the most is making his pious servants happy. This can be done through fulfilling their hunger, sweeping away their sorrows, or paying off their debts. His descendants according to Ismaili Imama doctrine See also Family tree of Muhammad Hashtag family tree linking prophets to Imams Imama Shia doctrine Imamate Twelver Doctrine, Qasim ibn Hassan, Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya, List of extinct Shia sects, Musa al Qadim, Ismail ibn Jafar. Topic. Notes. Topic. References. Topic. Further reading. Muhammad al Husayn al Mudafar, Imam Jafar al Sadiq. Sayyid Mahdi as Sadr, the Alul Bayt ethical role models. Muhammad Hussein il Adib, The Brief History of the Fourteen Infallibales. Fahd, Taufiq. Ghafar as Sadiq et la tradition scientifique arabe. Jafar as Sadiq and the Arabic scientific tradition. In Fahd, Taufiq, La Shizma Imamite. Colloque de Strasbourg, 6 to 9 May 1968, in French, Paris, Presses Universitaires de France, pp. 131 to 142. Topic. External links. Jafar al Sadiq, Encyclopedia Iranica. Jafar ibn Muhammad, Encyclopedia Britannica. Imam al Sadiq by Sheikh Muhammad al Husayn al Muzaffar, Tahid al Mufaddal, as dictated by Imam Jafar as Sadiq to al Mufaddal. <laughs>